Fountain By Isaac Asimov Audiobook 12 of 14 I had only old maps to guide me. They would have to be old, indeed, for, for star positions to be misplaced. Barr sat quite still, while the other's eyes drifted away into a reverie. He noticed that the nuclear force shield had vanished from about the man and admitted dryly to himself that his person no longer seemed formidable to strangers. Or even, for good or for evil, to his enemies. He said, My house is poor and my resources few. You may share what I have if your stomach can endure black bread and dried corn. Mallow shook his head, No, I have eaten, and I can't stay. All I need are the directions to the center of government. That is easily enough done, and poor though I am, deprives me of nothing. Do you mean the capital of the planet, or of the imperial sector? The younger man's eyes narrowed, aren't the two identical? Isn't this Siwena? The old patrician nodded slowly, Siwena, yes. But Siwena is no longer capital of the Normanic sector. Your old map has misled you after all. The stars may not change even in centuries, but political boundaries are all too fluid. That's too bad. In fact, that's very bad. Is the new capital far off? It's on Orsha too. Twenty parsecs off. Your map will direct you. How old is it? A hundred and fifty years. That old. The old man sighed. History has been crowded since. Do you know any of it? Mallow shook his bead slowly. Barr said, You're fortunate. It has been an evil time for the provinces, but for the reign of Stan Nell VI, and he died fifty years ago. Since that time, rebellion and ruin, ruin and rebellion. Barr wondered if he were growing garrulous. It was a lonely life out here, and he had so little chance to talk to men. Mallow said with sudden sharpness, Ruin, eh? You sound as if the province were impoverished. Perhaps not on an absolute scale. The physical resources of 25 first-rank planets take a long time to use up. Compared to the wealth of the last century, though, we have gone a long way downhill. And there is no sign of turning, not yet. Why are you so interested in all this, young man? You are all alive and your eyes shine. The traitor came near enough to blushing, as the faded eyes seemed to look too deep into his and smile at what they saw. He said, now look here. I'm a traitor out there. Out toward the rim of the galaxy. I've located some old maps and I'm out to open new markets. Naturally, talk of impoverished provinces disturbs me. You can't get money out of a world unless money's there to be got. Now how Siwena, for instance? The old man leaned forward, I cannot say. It will do even yet, perhaps. But you a traitor? You look more like a fighting man. You hold your hand near your gun and there is a scar on your jawbone. Mallow jerked his head, there isn't much law out there where I come from. Fighting and scars are part of a trader's overhead. But fighting is only useful when there's money at the end, and if I can get it without, so much the sweeter. Now will I find enough money here to make it worth the fighting? I take it I can find the fighting easily enough. Easily enough? Agreed Barr. You could join Whiskered's remnants in the Red Stars. I don't know, though, if you'd call that fighting or piracy. Or you could join our present gracious Viceroy. Gracious by right of murder, pillage, rapine, and the word of a boy emperor, since rightfully assassinated. The patrician's thin cheeks reddened. His eyes closed and then opened, bird bright. You don't sound very friendly to the Viceroy, Patrician Barr, said Mallow. What if I'm one of his spies? What if you are? said Barr, bitterly. What can you take? 
he gestured a withered arm at the bare interior of the decaying mansion. Your life. It would leave me easily enough. It has been with me five years too long. But you are not one of the Viceroy's men. If you were, perhaps even now instinctive self-preservation would keep my mouth closed. How do you know? The old man laughed, you seem suspicious. Come, I'll wager you think I'm trying to trap you into denouncing the government. No, no. I am past politics. Past politics? Is a man ever past that? The words you used to describe the Viceroy. What were they? Murder, pillage, all that. You didn't sound objective. Not exactly. Not as if you were past politics. The old man shrugged, memories sting when they come suddenly. Listen. Judge for yourself. When Siwena was the provincial capital, I was a patrician and a member of the provincial senate. My family was an old and honored one. One of my great-grandfathers had been no, never mind that. Past glories are poor feeding. I take it, said Mallow, there was a civil war, or a revolution. Barr's face darkened. Civil wars are chronic in these degenerate days, but Siwena had kept apart. Understand Nell 6, it had almost achieved its ancient prosperity. But weak emperors followed, and weak emperors mean strong viceroys, and our last viceroy. The same whiskered, whose remnants still prey on the commerce among the red stars. Aimed at the imperial purple. He wasn't the first to aim. And if he had succeeded, he wouldn't have been the first to succeed. But he failed. For when the emperor's admiral approached the province at the head of a fleet, Siwena itself rebelled against its rebel viceroy. He stopped, sadly. Mallow found himself tense on the edge of his seat, and relaxed slowly, Please continue, sir. Thank you, said Barr, wearily. It's kind of you to humor an old man. They rebelled, or I should say, we rebelled, for I was one of the minor leaders. Whiskered left Siwena, barely ahead of us, and the planet, and with it the province, were thrown open to the admiral with every gesture of loyalty to the emperor. Why we did this? I'm not sure. Maybe we felt loyal to the symbol, if not the person, of the emperor. A cruel and vicious child. Maybe we feared the horrors of a siege. Well. Urged Mallow, gently. Well came the grim retort, that didn't suit the admiral. He wanted the glory of conquering a rebellious province and his men wanted the loot such conquest would involve. So while the people were still gathered in every large city, cheering the emperor and his admiral, he occupied all armed centers, and then ordered the population put to the nuclear blast. On what pretext? On the pretext that they had rebelled against their viceroy, the emperor's anointed. And the admiral became the new viceroy, by virtue of one month of massacre, pillage, and complete horror. I had six sons. Five died. Variously. I had a daughter. I hope she died, eventually. I escaped because I was old. I came here, too old to cause even our viceroy worry. He bent his grey head. They left me nothing, because I had helped drive out a rebellious governor and deprived an admiral of his glory. Mallow sat silent, and waited. Then, what of your sixth son? He asked softly. At. Barr smiled acidly. He is safe, for he has joined the admiral as a common soldier under an assumed name. He is a gunner in the viceroy's personal fleet. Oh. No, I see your eyes. He is not an unnatural son. He visits me when he can and gives me what he can. He keeps me alive. And someday, our great and glorious viceroy will grovel to his death, and it will be my son who will be his executioner. 
and you tell this to a stranger? You endanger your son. No. I help him, by introducing a new enemy. And were I a friend of the Viceroy, as I am his enemy, I would tell him to string outer space with ships, clear to the rim of the galaxy. There are no ships there. Did you find any? Did any space guards question your entry? With ships few enough, and the bordering provinces filled with their share of intrigue and iniquity, none can be spared to guard the barbarian outer suns. No danger ever threatened us from the broken edge of the galaxy. Until you came. I? I'm no danger. There will be more after you. Mallow shook his head slowly, I'm not sure I understand you. Listen. There was a feverish edge to the old man's voice. I knew you when you entered. You have a force shield about your body, or had when I first saw you. Doubtful silence, then, yes. I had. Good. That was a flaw, but you didn't know that. There are some things I know. It's out of fashion in these decaying times to be a scholar. Events race and flash past and who cannot fight the tide with nuclear blast in hand is swept away, as I was. But I was a scholar, and I know that in all the history of Nucleix, no portable force shield was ever invented. We have force shields. Huge, lumbering powerhouses that will protect a city, or even a ship, but not one, single man. Ah! Mallow's under lip thrust out. And what do you deduce from that? There have been stories percolating through space. They travel strange paths and become distorted with every parsec. But when I was young there was a small ship of strange men, who did not know our customs and could not tell where they came from. They talked of magicians at the edge of the galaxy, magicians who glowed in the darkness, who flew unaided through the air, and whom weapons would not touch. We laughed. I laughed, too. I forgot it till today. But you glow in the darkness, and I don't think my blaster, if I had one, would hurt you. Tell me, can you fly through air as you sit there now? Mallow said calmly, I can make nothing of all this. Barr smiled, I'm content with the answer. I do not examine my guests. But if there are magicians, if you are one of them, there may someday be a great influx of them, or you. Perhaps that would be well. Maybe we need new blood. He muttered soundlessly to himself, then, slowly, but it works the other way, too. Our new viceroy also dreams, as did our old whiskered. Also after the emperor's crown. Bar nodded, my son hears tales. In the viceroy's personal entourage, one could scarcely help it. And he tells me of them. Our new viceroy would not refuse the crown if offered, but he guards his line of retreat. There are stories that, failing imperial heights, he plans to carve out a new empire in the barbarian hinterland. It is said, but I don't vouch for this, that he has already given one of his daughters as wife to a kinglet somewhere in the uncharted periphery. If one listened to every story I know. There are many more. I'm old and I babble nonsense. But what do you say? And those sharp, old eyes peered deep. The traitor considered, I say nothing. But I'd like to ask something. Does Siwena have nuclear power? Now, wait, I know that it possesses the knowledge of nucleix. I mean, do they have power generators intact, or did the recent sack destroy them? Destroy them? Oh, no. Half a planet would be wiped out before the smallest power station would be touched. They are irreplaceable and the suppliers of the strength of the fleet. Almost proudly, we have the largest and best on this side of Trantor itself. Then what would I do first if I wanted to see these generators? Nothing. Replied Barr, decisively. 
you couldn't approach any military center without being shot down instantly. Neither could anyone. Siwena is still deprived of civic rights. You mean all the power stations are under the military? No. There are the small city stations, the ones supplying power for heating and lighting homes, powering vehicles, and so forth. Those are almost as bad. They're controlled by the tech men. Who are they? A specialized group which supervises the power plants. The honor is hereditary, the young ones being brought up in the profession as apprentices. Strict sense of duty, honor, and all that. No one but a tech man could enter a station. I see. I don't say, though, added Barr, that there aren't cases where tech men haven't been bribed. In days when we have nine emperors in fifty years and seven of these are assassinated. When every space captain aspires to the usurpation of a viceroyship, and every viceroy to the imperium, I suppose even a tech man can fall prey to money. But it would require a good deal, and I have none. Have you? Money? No. But does one always bribe with money? What else, when money buys all else? There is quite enough that money won't buy. And now if you'll tell me the nearest city with one of the stations, and how best to get there, I'll thank you. Wait. Barr held out his thin hands. Where do you rush? You come here, but I ask no questions. In the city, where the inhabitants are still called rebels, you would be challenged by the first soldier or guard who heard your accent and saw your clothes. He rose and from an obscure comer of an old chest brought out a booklet. My passport. Forged. I escaped with it. He placed it in Mallow's hand and folded the fingers over it. The description doesn't fit, but if you flourish it, the chances are many to one they will not look closely. But you. You'll be left without one. The old exile shrugged cynically, what of it? And a further caution. Curb your tongue. Your accent is barbarous, your idioms peculiar, and every once in a while you deliver yourself of the most astounding archaisms. The less you speak, the less suspicion you will draw upon yourself. Now I'll tell you how to get to the city five minutes later, Mallow was gone. He returned but once, for a moment, to the old patrician's house before leaving it entirely, however. And when Onam Bar stepped into his little garden early the next morning, he found a box at his feet. It contained provisions, concentrated provisions such as one would find aboard ship, an alien in taste and preparation. But they were good, and lasted long. 11. The tech man was short, and his skin glistened with well-kept plumpness. His hair was a fringe and his skull shone through pinkly. The rings on his fingers were thick and heavy, his clothes were scented, and he was the first man Mallow had met on the planet who hadn't looked hungry. The tech man's lips pursed peevishly, now, my man, quickly. I have things of great importance waiting for me. You seem a stranger he seemed to evaluate Mallow's definitely unsiwenous costume and his eyelids were heavy with suspicion. I am not of the neighborhood, said Mallow, calmly, but the matter is irrelevant. I have had the honor to send you a little gift yesterday the tech man's nose lifted, I received it. An interesting Yuga. I may have use for it on occasion. I have other and more interesting gifts. Quite out of the Yuga stage. O.H. The tech man's voice lingered thoughtfully over the monosyllable. I think I already see the course of the interview, it has happened before. You are going to give me some trifle or other. A few credits, perhaps a cloak, second-rate jewelry, anything your little soul may think sufficient to corrupt a tech man. His lower lip puffed out belligerently, and I know what you wish in exchange. There have been others and to spare with the same bright idea. You wish to be adopted into our clan. 
you wish to be taught the mysteries of nucleics and the care of the machines. You think because you dogs of Siwena. And probably your strangerhood is assumed for safety's sake. Are being daily punished for your rebellion that you can escape what you deserve by throwing over yourselves the privileges and protections of the Tech Man's Guild. Mallow would have spoken, but the Tech Man raised himself into a sudden roar. And now leave before I report your name to the protector of the city. Do you think that I would betray the trust? The Siwenis traitors that preceded me would have. Perhaps. But you deal with a different breed now. Why, Galaxy, I marvel that I do not kill you myself at this moment with my bare hands. Mallow smiled to himself. The entire speech was patently artificial in tone and content, so that all the dignified indignation degenerated into uninspired farce. The traitor glanced humorously at the two flabby hands that had been named as his possible executioners then and there, and said, Your wisdom, you are wrong on three counts. First, I am not a creature of the Viceroy come to test your loyalty. Second, my gift is something the Emperor himself in all his splendor does not and will never possess. Third, what I wish in return is very little, a nothing, a mere breath. So you say. He descended into heavy sarcasm. Come, what is this imperial donation that your godlike power wishes to bestow upon me? Something the emperor doesn't have, eh? He broke into a sharp squawk of derision. Mallow rose and pushed the chair aside, I have waited three days to see you, your wisdom, but the display will take only three seconds. If you will just draw that blaster whose butt I see very near your hand at. And shoot me, I will be obliged. What? If I am killed, you can tell the police I tried to bribe you into betraying guild secrets. You'll receive high praise. If I am not killed, you may have my shield. For the first time, the tech man became aware of the dimly white illumination that hovered closely about his visitor as though he had been dipped in pearl dust. His blaster raised to the level and with eyes a squint in wonder and suspicion, he closed contact. The molecules of air caught in the sudden surge of atomic disruption, tore into glowing, burning ions, and marked out the blinding thin line that struck at Mallow's heart. And splashed. While Mallow's look of patience never changed, the nuclear forces that tore at him consumed themselves against that fragile, pearly illumination, and crashed back to die in mid-air. The tech man's blaster dropped to the floor with an unnoticed crash. Mallow said, Does the Emperor have a personal force shield? You can have one. The tech man stuttered, Are you a tech man? No. Then. Then where did you get that? What do you care? Mallow was coolly contemptuous. Do you want it? A thin, knobbed chain fell upon the desk, there it is. The tech man snatched it up and fingered it nervously, is this complete? Complete? Where's the power? Mallow's finger fell upon the largest knob, dull in its leaden case. The tech man looked up, and his face was congested with blood. Sir, I am a tech man, senior grade. I have twenty years behind me as supervisor and I studied under the great beer at the University of Trantor. If you have the infernal charlatanry to tell me that a small container the size of a... of a walnut, blast it, holds a nuclear generator, I'll have you before the protector in three seconds. Explain it yourself then, if you can. I say it's complete. The tech man's flush faded slowly as he bound the chain about his waist, and, following Mallow's gesture, pushed the knob. The radiance that surrounded him shone into dim relief. His blaster lifted, then hesitated. Slowly, he adjusted it to an almost burnless minimum. And then, convulsively, he closed circuit and the nuclear fire dashed against his hand harmlessly. Dot he whirled, and what if I shoot you now, and keep the shield? 
try. Said Mello. Do you think I gave you my only sample? And he, too, was solidly encased in light. The tech man giggled nervously. The blaster clattered onto the desk. He said, and what is this mere nothing, this breath, that you wish in return? I want to see your generators. You realize that that is forbidden. It would mean ejection into space for both of us I don't want to touch them or have anything to do with them. I want to see them from a distance. If not. If not, you have your shield, but I have other things. For one thing, a blaster especially designed to pierce that shield. Hmm, hmm, hmm. The tech man's eyes shifted. Come with me. Twelve. The tech man's home was a small two-story affair on the outskirts of the huge, cubiform, windowless affair that dominated the center of the city. Mallow passed from one to the other through an underground passage, and found himself in the silent, ozone-tinged atmosphere of the powerhouse. For fifteen minutes, he followed his guide and said nothing. His eyes missed nothing. His fingers touched nothing. And then, the tech man said in strangled tones, Have you had enough? I couldn't trust my underlings in this case. Could you ever? Asked Mallow, ironically. I've had enough. They were back in the office and Mallow said, thoughtfully, And all those generators are in your hands. Everyone, said the tech man, with more than a touch of complacency. And you keep them running and in order. Right. And if they break down? The tech man shook his head indignantly, they don't break down. They never break down. They were built for eternity. Eternity is a long time. Just suppose it is unscientific to suppose meaningless cases. All right. Suppose I were to blast a vital part into nothingness? I suppose the machines aren't immune to nuclear forces? Suppose I fuse a vital connection, or smash a quartz D-tube? Well, then, shouted the tech man, furiously, you would be killed. Yes, I know that, Mallow was shouting, too, but what about the generator? Could you repair it? Sir? The tech man howled his words, you have had a fair return. You've had what you asked for. Now get out. I owe you nothing more. Mallow bowed with a satiric respect and left. Two days later he was back where the far star waited to return with him to the planet, Terminus. And two days later, the tech man's shield went dead, and for all his puzzling and cursing never glowed again. 13. Mallow relaxed for almost the first time in six months. He was on his back in the sunroom of his new house, stripped to the skin. His great, brown arms were thrown up and out, and the muscles tautened into a stretch, then faded into repose. The man beside him placed a cigar between Mallow's teeth and lit it. He champed on one of his own and said, You must be overworked. Maybe you need a long rest. Maybe I do, jail, but I'd rather rest in a council seat. Because I'm going to have that seat, and you're going to help me. Anchor Jail raised his eyebrows and said, How did I get into this? You got in obviously. Firstly, you're an old dog of a politico. Secondly, you were booted out of your cabinet seat by Jorane Sutt the same fellow who'd rather lose an eyeball than see me in the council. You don't think much of my chances, do you? Not much, agreed the ex-minister of education. You're a Smyrnian. That's no legal bar. I've had a lay education. Well, come now. Since when does prejudice follow any law but its own? Now, how about your own man? This James Twer? What does he say? He spoke about running me for council almost a year ago, replied Mallow easily, but I've outgrown him. He couldn't have pulled it off in any case. Not enough depth. 
he's loud and forceful. But that's only an expression of nuisance value. I'm off to put over a real coup. I need you. Jorain Sut is the cleverest politician on the planet and he'll be against you. I don't claim to be able to outsmart him. And don't think he doesn't fight hard, and dirty. I've got money. Matt helps. But it takes a lot to buy off prejudice, you dirty Smyrnian. I'll have a lot. Well, I'll look into the matter. But don't ever you crawl up on your hind legs and bleat that I encouraged you in the matter. Who's that? Mallow pulled the corners of his mouth down, and said, Jorain Sut himself, I think. He's early, and I can understand it. I've been dodging him for a month. Look, Jail, get into the next room, and turn the speaker on low. I want you to listen. He helped the council member out of the room with a shove of his bare foot, then scrambled up and into a silk robe. The synthetic sunlight faded to normal power. The secretary to the mayor entered stiffly, while the solemn major domo tiptoed the door shut behind him. Mallow fastened his belt and said, Take your choice of chairs, Sut. Sut barely cracked a flickering smile. The chair he chose was comfortable but he did not relax into it. From its edge, he said, if you'll state your terms to begin with, we'll get down to business. What terms? You wish to be coaxed? Well, then, what, for instance, did you do at Coral? Your report was incomplete. I gave it to you months ago. You were satisfied then? Yes. Sut rubbed his forehead thoughtfully with one finger, but since then your activities have been significant. We know a good deal of what you are doing, Mallow. We know, exactly, how many factories you are putting up, in what a hurry you are doing it, and how much it's costing you. And there's this palace you have, he gazed about him with a cold lack of appreciation, which set you back considerably more than my annual salary and a swathe you've been cutting. A very considerable and expensive swathe. Through the upper layers of foundation society. So? Beyond proving that you employ capable spies, what does it show? It shows you have money you didn't have a year ago. And that can show anything. For instance, that a good deal went on at Coral that we know nothing of. Where are you getting your money? My dear Sut, you can't really expect me to tell you. I don't. I didn't think you did. That's why I'm going to tell you. It's straight from the treasure chests of the Commander of Coral. Sut blinked. Mallow smiled and continued. Unfortunately for you, the money is quite legitimate. I'm a master trader and the money I received was a quantity of wrought iron and chromite in exchange for a number of trinkets I was able to supply him with. 50% of the profit is mine by hidebound contract with the foundation. The other half goes to the government at the end of the year when all good citizens pay their income tax. There was no mention of any trade agreement in your report. Nor was there any mention of what I had for breakfast that day or the name of my current mistress, or any other irrelevant detail. Mallow's smile was fading into a sneer. I was sent. To quote yourself. To keep my eyes open. They were never. Shut. You wanted to find out what happened to the captured Foundation merchant ships. I never saw or heard of them. You wanted to find out if Coral had nuclear power. My report tells of nuclear blasters in the possession of the Commander's private bodyguard. I saw no other signs. And the blasters I did see are relics of the old empire, and maybe show pieces that do not work, for all my knowledge. So far, I followed orders, but beyond that I was, and still am, a free agent. According to the laws of the Foundation, a master trader may open whatever new markets he can, and receive therefrom his due half of the profits. 
What are your objections? I don't see them. Sut bent his eyes carefully towards the wall and spoke with a difficult lack of anger, it is the general custom of all traders to advance the religion with their trade. I adhere to law, and not to custom. There are times when custom can be the higher law. Then appeal to the courts. Sut raised somber eyes which seemed to retreat into their sockets. You're a Smyrnian after all. It seems naturalization and education can't wipe out the taint in the blood. Listen, and try to understand, just the same. This goes beyond money, or markets. We have the science of the great Harry Seldon to prove that upon us depends the future empire of the galaxy, and from the course that leads to that imperium we cannot turn. The religion we have is our all-important instrument towards that end. With it we have brought the four kingdoms under our control, even at the moment when they would have crushed us. It is the most potent device known with which to control men and worlds. The primary reason for the development of trade and traders was to introduce and spread this religion more quickly, and to ensure that the introduction of new techniques and a new economy would be subject to our thorough and intimate control. He paused for breath, and Mallow interjected quietly, I know the theory. I understand it entirely. Do you? It is more than I expected. Then you see, of course, that your attempt at trade for its own sake, at mass production of worthless gadgets, which can only affect a world's economy superficially, at the subversion of interstellar policy to the god of profits, at the divorce of nuclear power from our controlling religion can only end with the overthrow and complete negation of the policy that has worked successfully for a century. And time enough, too, said Mallow, indifferently, for a policy outdated, dangerous, and impossible. However well your religion has succeeded in the four kingdoms, scarcely another world in the periphery has accepted it. At the time we seized control of the kingdoms, there were a sufficient number of exiles, Galaxy knows, to spread the story of how Salver Harden used the priesthood and the superstition of the people to overthrow the independence and power of the secular monarchs. And if that wasn't enough, the case of Ascone two decades back made it plain enough. There isn't a ruler in the periphery now that wouldn't sooner cut his own throat than let a priest of the Foundation enter the territory. I don't propose to force Coral or any other world to accept something I know they don't want. No, Sut. If nuclear power makes them dangerous, a sincere friendship through trade will be many times better than an insecure overlordship, based on the hated supremacy of a foreign spiritual power, which, once it weakens ever so slightly, can only fall entirely and leave nothing substantial behind except an immortal fear and hate. Suit said cynically, very nicely put. So, to get back to the original point of discussion, what are your terms? What do you require to exchange your ideas for mine? You think my convictions are for sale? Why not? Came the cold response. Isn't that your business, buying and selling? Only at a profit, said Mallow, unoffended. Audiobook generated by, read with the ears.